This New Year's Eve, we have the Dirichlet integral again, but we're going to solve it this time using contour integration, which is uh, a cool solution. I mean, not as awesome as uh, using something like Feynman's technique of differentiating under the integral sign, um, link in the description below, or even the Laplace transform, again, linked in the, in the description below. But still, it's a very cool example of contour integration. So here... What we're going to do is we're going to need to use the residue theorem here. So according to the residue theorem, if you have the integral over some closed contour C of a complex valued function f of z, then this equals 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of that function f of z enclosed by that contour. And we're going to use Jordan's lemma. Only recently have I found out that this is actually because of some French dude, Jordan. So uh, Jordan, Jordan, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. This is just that awesome lemma that helps you evaluate or get rid of some contours or some curves. Anyway, so to solve this integral, we'll first of all note that this is the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity, uh, from negative to positive infinity, of e to the ix divided by x with respect to x. So it's this integral here that we're going to be evaluating. So let me define an integral i as the integral along a closed contour c of e to the iz divided by z dz. Now, how exactly should I define my contour? Well, first up, note the structure of your function. Your function f of z is e to the iz divided by z. So you may be tempted to use that semicircular contour, but if I just draw the complex plane in front of you where x is the x is the real part of the complex number z and y is the imaginary part, then the problem with the classic semicircular contour is that it will pass through the singularity at z equals zero. And you want your contours to enclose or altogether avoid your singularities. You're not supposed to just walk through or pass through a singularity. So we're going to adopt the strategy of actually avoiding the singularity on the complex plane. So we are going to use a semicircle traversed in the anti-clockwise sense. But when we get to the, uh, the x-axis or the real axis, we're going to just... Um, circumvent the singularity at z equals zero by drawing a smaller semicircle of radius say epsilon and the radius of our um, the outer semicircle let's call it r so this is your contour traversed in the anti-clockwise sense and it looks kind of cool it does look pretty cool so you can write your integral i as the uh collection of a few integrals, in fact. So i, which is the integral uh, over the closed contour c of e to the i z divided by z dz, is in fact the integral over the contour, uh, let's call this outer curve gamma, and this uh, inner semicircle little gamma. So the integrals over gamma and little gamma plus a couple of integrals on the real line. So we have the integral from negative r to negative epsilon of e to the i x divided by x with respect to x. And uh, you can replace z here by x because we're on the real line anyway. Plus the integral from epsilon to r of e to the i x divided by x with respect to x. And uh, before we do anything else, let's take, a, let's take a moment to see whether we're on the right track. So we were interested in the integral from negative to positive infinity of sine of x by x with respect to x, right? So yeah, in the limit as in the limits as r approaches infinity and epsilon approaches zero, uh, these two integrals on the real line they seem quite promising. So yeah, it looks like we're on the right track. And first up, before we integrate the two uh, uh, the integrals over the two semicircles, I would first like to apply the residue theorem here. So this is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues enclosed by your contour. Now we have circumvented the only singularity 
available to us. We had a singularity at z equals zero, right? And we just completely avoided it. So your contour encloses absolutely no singularities. So you don't have any residues over here. In other words, all of this evaluates to zero. So the left-hand side of your equation can be replaced by zero. Okay, that's cool. And now we can turn our attention to the integrals over the two semicircles, starting with this gamma integral. So the integral over the curve gamma of e to the i z divided by z dz equals, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I represent any complex number uh, on this uh, semicircle gamma by uh, using uh, a vector to represent this complex number, then we see that pretty much any complex number located on this contour can be represented in the polar form by r times e to the i phi, where phi here would vary between uh, vary from zero to pi radians, correct? So that means we can replace all the z's here by r times e to the i phi's, right? So e to the i r e to the i phi, and the differential element z here equals r e i phi, which implies that dz equals i r e to the i times phi d phi. So we're now in a phi world and our limits transform to zero and pi, and we have lots of nice stuff that cancels out, correct? So all of this cancels out here, and we're left with the integral from zero to pi of e to the i r, and we can expand this exponential term here using Euler's identity. We can write it as the cosine of phi, of phi plus i times the sine of phi, and this will be pretty handy. And the only thing left here is i, correct? So let's write it here, d phi. Now, writing uh, these terms as separate exponentials being multiplied, I have i r, using the uh, distributed property, cosine of phi, and i times i is i squared, which is negative 1, right? So negative uh, r times the uh, sine of phi, d phi. And I wanted to write these as separate exponentials. So uh, yeah, e and then a minus sign. And that is a horrible way to write Euler's number. Sorry about that. Yeah, much better. So this is the integral over the contour gamma. Now we're going to make use of, of Jordan's lemma. So we know one property of definite integrals, right? That if we integrate some complex valued function f over a contour c, and we take the absolute, absolute value, that's going to be less than or equal to the integral over the same contour of the absolute value of the same function. So if I take absolute values on both sides, and if I just take this absolute value operation inside the integration operation, I'm going to have to replace this equal to sign by a less than or equal to sign, correct? Okay, this seems cool. And then I can use the fact that if I multiply two complex numbers and take the modulus, then this is equivalent to multiplying the moduli of the two complex numbers. So distributing this modulus operation as well, so we can write the left-hand side as the integral from 0 to pi of i, e to the i r cosine of phi. Forgive me for calling this the absolute value. I know that's not exactly the right terminology to use here. Just, you know, I just said that in a flow. This should be called the modulus, its correct name. So terribly sorry for that. Anyway. Now, the modulus of i is just 1, correct? And this is e to the i times r cosine of phi. This is just any real number, right? Any real number t. And you can verify using Euler's identity that the modulus of e to the i t equals 1 whenever t is a real number. So you can just get rid of this as well. And now you can write this in a more presentable form. And you have e to the negative r sine phi 
which is a positive number, of course. Sorry about that. Which is a positive number, of course. So the modulus, which in this case is the absolute value, just uh, isn't needed. Anyway, so that means your ga your uh, gamma integral is less than or equal to this integral here, uh, the absolute value of the gamma integral anyway. And in the limit as r approaches infinity, this exponential term will approach zero, right? So that means your gamma integral actually approaches zero in the limit as r approaches infinity. So that means your gamma integral just vanishes, right? In that limit so you can just get rid of it and let's write let's just erase it altogether and now to turn our attention to this little gamma integral now little gamma is also a semicircle and let me just highlight it in a different color in this case we're going from pi to zero right along this little gamma contour. We're going from pi to zero in the phi world, right? So we already know how the integral will transform uh, from the z world to the phi world. So let's just write it as the integral from pi to zero, from pi to zero of e to the i um, epsilon e to the i phi. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Divided by epsilon e to the i phi. And again, this uh, differential element, which is i epsilon e to the i phi d phi. Lots of great cancellations. And wow, you can write this uh, with a negative sign. Integral from zero to pi. If you switch up the limits, that is. i e to the i epsilon e to the i phi. And my boy Myers actually solved this integral using Feynman's, using Feynman's trick. He differentiated, I think, with respect to epsilon. So when I saw its solution, I said, damn, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So you can try differentiating with respect to epsilon, but just to save time, I'm not going to do that here. But to be honest, that was <laughs> the most awesome crossover of Feynman's technique and contour integration in the same question that I've ever seen. So yeah, his solution definitely put a smile on my face. So good job. Anyway, the coolest solution aside, um, I'm just going to perform a simple analysis of this integral in the limit as epsilon approaches zero. So first up, take this constant multiple outside. Now as epsilon approaches zero, all of this is going to approach zero as well, right? So you're going to, in the uh, in the limit as epsilon approaches zero, you're going to approach e to the zero, which is one. And the integral of one between zero and pi is just pi, right? So you have a negative sign outside and i times pi. That's your integral over little gamma. In the limit, of course, as epsilon approaches zero. So going back to our equation up here, found it. So this is our equation. And in the limit as epsilon approaches zero and r approaches infinity, you can just replace lots of stuff here. Up here, you're going to have a zero, negative infinity, zero, positive infinity. And now you can just combine these two integrals, correct? So if you combine them, you have uh, the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the i x divided by x and the uh, the uh, integral over over the capital gamma uh, contour vanished vanished in the limit as r approached infinity and this integral in the limit as epsilon approaches zero is negative i pi so this is awesome this is awesome so just transfer it to the left hand side and you have your target integral being equal to i times pi and you wanted the imaginary part of this integral, right? So this implies that the integral from negative to positive infinity of sine of x divided by x equals pi. And it also implies that the uh, associated real part, the integral from negative to positive infinity of the cosine of x divided by x is zero, which makes sense for the integral of an odd function over a symmetric interval. So yeah, it made sense 
for that. It made sense for all of this to happen. And the result is awesome. The integration was extremely cool, extremely fun to perform. But however, uh, although this is extremely cool, I admit this is extremely cool, I still think I still think that, or in my opinion, my favorite technique for solving the Dirichlet integral is using Feynman's technique. So that's pretty much my favorite. And I think that's a relatively more efficient than it. Or maybe it's just more fun to do it that way. And the most efficient method, uh, the award for efficiency, will go to the Laplace transform evaluation. So I've linked both those videos in the description. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. See you next time.